everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I write and report all about all kinds of endurance sports and weird niche sports and all kinds of fun stuff like that here over on the Outdoor Edit and at a bunch of different magazines. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and endurance coach. Yeah, and today's guest is also a pretty long-time journalist, and he and I have actually even worked for sort of sister magazines. He was over at Runner's World while I was at Bicycling Magazine. Uh, so Alex Hutchinson joins us today. That's a pretty exciting one. Yeah, Alex is a columnist for Outside Magazine. As Molly mentioned, he just finished up at Runner's World where he had a very popular column. Um, and then he's also, you've seen him in the Globe and Mail for Toronto Dwellers and then also New Yorker and New for York the Times. Americans. <laughs> Yeah, he's covered all sorts of events. We talk about the two-hour marathon attempt he was covering a little bit, and he's been at all sorts of the, the big sort of events. And he's got a new book, Endure, which I just devoured. It was really, really good. I recommend it for sure if you're interested in endurance sports. It really sort of gives you a good overview of all the, the things that could be limiting your performance, which we're all interested in. Yeah, and before we get too far down that rabbit hole, I will also point out, so Endure, uh, subtitle Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance, is also going to be the Athletic Bookworms book read for March. So if you're interested in kind of following along with some really lively discussions on all things endurance related, uh, hop over to theoutdooredit.com for the details on that coming on Thursday, the 1st of March. Uh, we're just finishing up Wired to Eat by Rob Wolf as February's book. So this is sort of a pretty good shift from from eating to how we do kind of everything and how our brains play into it. Although I will add, Rob's book is pretty awesome for talking about how how we feel and how we think connects to how we eat. Yeah, he sort of breaks it into social and movement. And then, so he sort of covers, there's four elements, yeah, including food as one of those. So it's, it's an odd nutrition book in that it's not just, not just the, the food. Yeah. And indeed, Alex's book as well talks about all the different factors. It's not just the training. It talks about the mind. It talks about fueling, hydration, um, you know, environmental factors. Tons of really cool stories in there. Really like a lot of individual you know, I mean, stories dating back to the early 1900s, 1800s stuff, but then also really up to the minute research. He said it took him ages to finally sign off on it because every time he'd try to put out a draft, a new study would come out and he'd want to add more to it or, you know, talk about something else and add this little reference note and stuff. And finally, they just had to say, OK, this is this is the final copy. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's a great book because it's not, you know, super sciencey. It reads a lot of times like more of a story, sort of maybe nonfiction book. But it's giving you these concepts that maybe you would get from a more practical sort of textbook thing. You know, you'll come up with a bit of an understanding of, you know, what is hydration versus what is sort of heat stroke or heat, you know, heat affected declines in performance. Um, you know, just what is what training matters, different things like this, right? How, how do these endurance performances change? Yeah, and actually, while we're on the topic of talking about the mind, I think I do want to kind of bring up a couple of things we've been up to lately. Uh, you know, we talked last week, we were at the Joyride 150 Bike Park in Markham uh, near Toronto for Women's Weekend, but Peter and I actually went back last Friday to do, Peter was doing some coaching, I was doing some practice on the jump lines, and I very excited that I finally actually managed to get a little bit of air on some of the jumps. It was nothing... To write home about. I'm not going to be going to the X Games anytime soon, but for me that was a pretty major uh, shift in my brain and it actually kind of brings to mind when Alex was able to break, what was it, four minutes in the 1500? Mm -hmm. uh, the story he tells about that where once he could do that once, breaking that was actually really easy. Um, I sort of felt the same way about jumping once I kind of got the line one time and really understood it. It was okay, this isn't actually as scary as I thought it was. and Yeah, you have these breakthroughs, or I guess they're in some ways it's like an aha moment, but it sort of becomes the new normal. Yeah, exactly. So the new normal is me just shredding and being super cool, just so everybody knows. Yeah, well, it's good. There's a lot of, you know, working with a couple of clients in there on their bike skills, getting ready for, you know, mountain bike season or, you know, gravel grinding season, and we're, you know, using the BMX bikes or the, the park to do that. So it's... 
It's a pretty fun place, this Joyride 150. Yeah, highly recommend checking it out. Um, and before we dive into this episode with Alex, I also wanted to remind you guys, if you haven't already checked out our seven-day kickstart guide to healthy habits, I uh, highly recommend you do that. You can find the link over at consummateathlete.com. It's just a free seven-day set of emails that'll show up in your inbox around 6 a.m. and kind of have some tips on how to make your day a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective, and a lot better for serving your training. Um, so if you want to make your training actually work better for you, really recommend checking this out and kind of using that to get started on some healthier habits. Yeah, definitely. It sort of highlights the that it's not just the training, not just the pedaling or the running or whatever you're into. It's, you know, there's that whole wellness or health element behind it where you have to sort of be ready and prepared to absorb that training. Yeah, so consummateathlete.com for that. And of course, as always, we'd love it if you enjoy this podcast, this episode with Alex, uh, leave us a rating or review over on iTunes. You can do it right in the app now. Super easy and very much appreciated. All right, without further ado, let's get into this episode with Alex Hutchinson. All right, welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. We're here today with Alex Hutchinson, who is an avid runner, but more importantly, you've seen many of his articles in publications like The Globe and Mail, uh, Runner's World, and most recently in Outside Magazine as well. So Alex, I'm sure that did not do you justice, but welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. Now, Alex has just come out with a new book, um, and it's called Endure, and it's a really, really interesting book. There's lots of different topics sort of about how we can squeeze those last elements of endurance. And, and you know, re- you, the really interesting part is that you look at this, this topic of endurance from all different levels, all different types of sports. So we thought it was absolutely imperative that we got you on the show to talk about it. And I thought to start off with, rather than going down sort of your bio, I thought maybe you could give us, you know, just a, a, one of the stories you told from it that I thought was just so perfect and, and sort of encapsulated a lot of the book was your, your experience at the Cherry Blossom 10 Mile, uh, racing against some really, really talented runners. So I think it does justice to how talented you are as a runner, but also sort of will get us kicked off with some of the topics you talk about in the book. Sure. This was a race that I ran, I think it was 2002, in Cherry Blossom 10 Milers down in Washington, D.C., where I was living at the time. And it was kind of my first foray into road racing, because I'd been running mostly track. And I had a chance to run against, there were about two dozen top road racers, almost all of them from Kenya. Um, So these are the guys who dominate the road racing circuit. And there were 12 prize money spots. So my hope was to sneak into the top 12 and get a couple hundred bucks towards rent. Uh, and <laughs> Noble pursuit. <laughs> which, yeah, exactly. It's amazing how much motivation you can get from a, you know, a little bit, a little bit of prize. So, and, and it, it, I was in good shape at the time. I was, I was, I ran on the Canadian national team at, uh, at the time uh, for in cross country and track. And so I felt like I, I, I should have a good shot at competing with, not the very top guys, because Cherry Blossom attracts the very best runners in the world, but, but with the guys who were fighting out for the last few prize money spots. But very early in the race, uh, you know, the top guys made a hard move and started taking off. And to my su- kind of surprise, everyone else in the lead pack followed. So it felt like a, an all-out sprint to me. <laughs> and so this was maybe two miles into a 10-mile race, and I had to make a decision. Do I try and follow all, you know, all of the rest of the invited runners to try and stay in contact or do I run my own best pace and do I run a sustainable pace that I can maintain to the finish and of course the logical thing for for uh, you know an analytical guy like me who's who's thought carefully about all the angles is Alex you'll maximize your performance if you run the best sustainable pace you can do from here to the finish that's the standard advice right and so that's what I did I let I let all the other runners go uh, and I was way, they were out of sight within a couple miles. So for the first half of the race, I was just on my own, running way behind everyone else. And the second half of the race plays out much as you might think or hope that it plays out. I, I, I start to see stragglers who've dropped off the back of the pack because they've gone too hard trying to stay with the leaders. And I start to pass them one by one. And some of them look like they've totally exploded. And there's like smoke coming out of their hamstrings. And, and one by one, I, I pick them off until I'm in 12th spot. I'm in the money. And there's one more canyon in front of me at the, as I approach the finish. I launch into a big sprint, catch him, finish 11th, win, I think it was 250 bucks. 
And so for a long time, that was like a story I told with great pride about what I, you know, how smart I had run and how I'd done good pacing and hadn't got sucked into the, to chasing the leaders. But as time went on, as I said, this was like 16 years ago. And as I, as I spent more time sort of studying endurance and, and talking to the best runners in the world and trying to understand what differentiates the, the top, the top runners from the rest of us, I started to rethink that and started to think maybe I was the one who was, who was making a mistake because if you think about running an even pace, which is what I tried to do, fundamentally what you're saying is you have decided how fast you're going to run from like one minute into the race. You've already decided what your finishing time is going to be, and you're, gonna, you're trying to maintain a perfectly even pace. So you kind of put a ceiling on your potential uh, performance. Now, that is, the, the, I think, the smart way to run if you want to maximize your overall average performance. You want to make sure that every race you run is pretty good and you avoid having some real stinkers. But what I started to think is maybe maybe you missed the chance of having the really great ones by by, avo- by not just going out and seeing what you can do and seeing what your body can do that day. And, it, and it's telling that, you know, the fact that these two dozen Kenyans that I race against all went with the leaders. And even the ones who were, you know, on paper, no better than me, they, they felt like that day could have been their day. So they were just going to run with the, the leaders and try and win the race instead of just pacing themselves. And uh, over time, I, I think that ends up, maybe they end up having more bad races, but they also end up giving themselves a chance to have great races. And when I look back at my own running career, I think, would I trade a bunch of decent average okay races for a couple of really timeless, amazing races? And of course the answer is yes. So all of that ties into one of the themes that come, came out of the book, which is the, the importance of belief of, of what you think you can do. And if you think, if you're setting your, your, your level of performance from the moment the starting gun fires, you're, you're, as, you're kind of setting limits on yourself, whether, whether you mean to or not. And so I wish, I wish looking back that I had sometimes been a little more aggressive and not been so kind of smart about things and just run with my guts and, and, and see what I could have done some days. And, and it's, it's tough, right? Because that's, you know, you, you mentioned in that same section of the book, you sort of, you had trained on that razor's edge and you knew your pace and you, you even had premeditated or not, you know, beforehand you had looked through all the, who was racing and you knew every competitor and you figured, you know, you, the best you could do would be right on that bubble of getting paid, right? That, that 12th would be a great day. Um, and, and I think a lot of us do that. And I guess the question and Molly was sort of confused about this too is you know how do we reconcile that you know when someone's maybe not doesn't have that those years of experience that you had with that razor's edge right like you see a lot of those new people will run you know like like children in some ways off the start and they'll try and go with the leader i've started a lot of 5ks at a dead sprint (laughs) right you start with the dead sprint like out of an (laughs) iron man triathlon right and so how do we come to terms with that is there there's some sort of reconciliation there yeah, you know, I think <laughs> I think no, no matter how much I tell myself that I'd like to be more aggressive or I wish I'd been more aggressive, um, that, that doesn't mean that I, I'm going to go back and, like you said, do, do the sort of eight-year-old just sprint until you can't anymore. Um, I think that there's, for one thing, there's there's not one right answer for everybody. Uh, my, my personality is very risk-averse, so I'm the kind of guy who needs to be prodded and pushed to say, take a chance, Alex, you know, give you, run the risk of failure by running a higher risk race, just to see if maybe, you know, try that sometimes just to see if maybe you're being overly cautious in the rest of your races. Now I've, I've had friends and training partners who are completely the opposite, who are constitutionally incapable of not sprinting at the start of workouts and races. (laughs) And those guys don't, those guys don't need that advice. Those guys need like collars on to hold them back <laughs> so so you, you have to kind of find the balance that's right for you but i guess so i guess for me i don't wish for myself that i had sprinted off the line in every race but i wish that i had sometimes on, on when the circumstances were right when it fits into my when it fit into my season and when it when my you know when i knew i was fit just said okay today i'm not racing against the clock i'm not worried about my splits today i'm racing against you know, whether it's someone else I know is a little bit better than me or whether it's just whoever's there in the race, you know, we all have to 
pick pick our goals relative to the context we're racing in. But I wish sometimes I had uh, been less analytical and more just sort of said, I know I've trained well. Let's find out how much I can handle by, by being a little more aggressive. I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, we'll hopefully try and break in sort of how that, that, how we integrate that into this understanding of endurance. Um, so in, in that, in that particular event, then, you know, you have sort of your physiological limits, you know, we are all familiar, you know, we've heard lactate threshold and VO2 max, um, you know, and, and now you're bringing in this concept of sort of your, your effort or your pacing, your, your sort of the brain side of it. Um, so in, in that respect, like are, when you're, when you're thinking about that, that effort and that limit that you hit in that race, um, have you come to terms with it? Do you think it was more from the, the effort and sort of that pacing and that, that pre planning, or do you think it was there? There's obviously a, a physiological side to that. Well, uh, you know, look, one, one thing I can say c- concretely about that race is that my last mile was the fastest that I, I, I ran, let's see, I wonder if I can remember my splits. You know, I ended up running 49.20, which is 456 or 450, let's see, 450, 450-something per mile. But I think I ran my last mile in something close to, like, 430 or something like that uh, because I was in a race with, you know, I was trying to catch the last couple guys. And so there's an indication that there was more in the tank, that that, like, during the race, for sure, I felt like, so the story in my head was that I knew the physiological knife edge, that I was running right at the limits of what I was capable of. But the, well, the stopwatch tells me that I wasn't on the knife edge because I was able to run that last mile so fast, that the, the, that the, the knife edge was a bit of an illusion. And, and uh, I think that's, that's kind of one of the, the other big takeaways from the book is that perception of effort that our perception of how hard we're going, it obviously depends on the physiological realities, how fast you're running on your lactate levels and things like that. But it also depends on a bunch of other things that are, uh, that, that can be manipulated in different ways that can be affected by different things, like your perception of what you're capable of. And, you know, it's like, I, I, I can remember one of my very first races in high school, uh, a cross country race where I was running against, you know, it was the city cross country championships. And when I had a teammate who was the leader of the team and to my surprise, you know, in the last, you know, few kilometers of the race, I, I caught up to him and I was running with him and there was like this barrier. I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine passing him because he was better than me. So I had this perception that I must be running as hard as I could because I was keeping up with, with my friend Kai uh, and then, you know, in the last half mile or so, I sort of had this realization that actually I'm not really running that hard. I think I could speed up. Maybe I don't have to stay behind Kai. And I took off and I blew away from him. And, and you know, it was it was one of those things where I, you know, it was just the, the flick of a switch, realizing that I was basing my sense of effort based on the fact that I was close to a guy who I thought would, would be really hard to be close to. And I think we do that with, with the stopwatch, too, and with, with, with other people and with Ex, with our expectations that we 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 sometimes let uh, you know externalities dictate what we think of as our as our limits. Right, right. And you mentioned things like you know people running the three hour marathon. Sort of, you see this big clustering of people who run just under three hours, but then a big you know drop off until you get to you know three and a half or four hours. Right. So they've accelerated to this abstract like really random number. Right. Yeah, and that, and that happens. It's like every hour barrier. It's also every half hour barrier. It's even ten minute barriers. You see that there's always more people just under any barrier than just over it. Which is at, which it, is there's it, no reason for that, right? Like it's just 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 time. Like if we're all different people and you assume they're going to be scattered randomly, you wouldn't assume that there's a clustering at ten minute increments. Yeah, exactly. So there's we're we're kind of we're we're setting our limits based on these externalities that's exactly exactly it and uh, you know this is natural and normal it's not like this is some crazy thing that that is totally inexplicable but it's a reminder that perception is created by these external benchmarks in in some ways and 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 that doesn't mean it's easy to change them but if you're aware of that you can you can remind yourself that okay maybe what feels like 
the, as fast as I can go is actually being kind of dragged down or dragged up by something else. And I guess just quickly then, I know you've told this story a few times uh, in a few of your other interviews, but I, I think it would be maybe illustrative of, you know, if, if those you know, 10 minute markers or one hour markers get moved. So in your, your case, it was a, a, what was it? 1600 meter, 1600 meter, 1500 meter race. Right. And and you had the, the mile markers removed. Your, your split times were sort of de- deceived on you. Uh, you yeah, were, not the right grammar there. Yeah. But... <laughs> sorry. You were deceived by your lap counter is what I'm going after. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I was, I, I, this was in third year university and I, I had been trying to break four minutes for 1500 for, several years, I'd been stuck right above it for almost four years. I'd been running 401, 402 over and over again. Uh, and I kind of, you know, that, that experience of training for several years and be running the same times over and over is really, really one of the things that makes you think, well, I guess I'm approaching my, my physical limits. Like I must be, I'm sure I can run 359, but that's probably about as much as I can hope for. And if I can do that, I'll walk away from the sport knowing I reached my physiological limits. And, uh, but then what happened at this, at this actually rather sort of meaningless small race where I didn't expect anything to happen is that the timekeeper was reading, I think he must have, either he started his watch late or he was, you know, having trouble translating from French to English while reading the splits or something. Anyway, he, he was reading out these tremendously fast splits that made me think I was going faster than I'd ever gone before without any additional effort. And so I, after a couple of laps, I said, I, 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 the, the splits were so fast that it's like, I don't even know what these mean anymore. I'm going to stop paying attention. I'm just going to conclude that I'm having the day of my life. This is a special day for whatever reason. Don't waste it, Alex. Just put your head down and get to the finish line as fast as possible. And I ended up running 352, which was a nine second personal best, which is a, a lot for someone who had been training hard for four or five years. Uh, and then what was really interesting is that I never, ever struggled to break four minutes again. Like that, that barrier was in the past. And in fact, in my next race, I ran 349. And in the race after that, I ran 344. So all of a sudden, this switch had flipped and that my expectation, all of a sudden, instead of thinking, I'm a guy who might be able to squeeze under four minutes if I get really, if I have the perfect race, I was like, whoa, I have way more in me than I realized. And therefore, I'm going to totally reset my goals and start running for a different, you know, at at a completely different level. So that was kind of the moment I think that if, if that this was 20, 20 some, 22 years ago, but if you had to kind of trace back to where this book comes from, it's, it, it, it's from that moment of realizing that, okay, li- these limits felt physical to me. They're not, uh, do we understand why? What can, what can we learn about how these sorts of limits get set? Yeah, I think that's, that's, it's an amazing story. I think a lot of people can sort of at least empathize or, or relate, you know, they've had some sort of, you know, their best day running, they felt amazing one day, but then not as good the next day, right? And I know certainly with the coaching clients I have, you know, you'll see that, right? They felt great on a run, and it could be, you know, for a variety of reasons, but we all sort of go through uh, this, well, how do, how do we do make more of that, right? We want it to happen again. Um, and so that's really, it is what the, the base of your book is. And I think that's a good segue then, you know, you started your book eight years ago thinking you were going to write it mostly around the the sort of Tim Noakes idea of central governor, right? Yeah, that's I, I originally thought the book was going to be really straightforward. It was going to be, you know, Tim Noakes came up with this idea of the central governor that the brain always holds us back to prevent us from hitting, uh, you know, limits that would be dangerous for the body. And that explains everything. And, you know, now <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll write a book about it and I'll be rich and famous and live happily ever after. But, it, it, you know, it turns out not to be that simple. And, and the, the deeper I got into the, the topic, the more I realized that there was there were other points of view and, and complexities. And at the end of the day, like the with a book, you, you always want to have this like, you know, cereal box message that you can take away that's really simple and, and easy to wrap up. And I don't really have that for this book. It's hard to say that it's like there's one simple message to take away. The, I mean, the message I, I, that I take away is limits uh, that appear physical are influenced by the brain, and that means they're negotiable. But exactly how that works is there's all there's a bunch of different theories out there, and I ended up, you know, and, and it's not just all in your head, right? Like as, as we were talking about earlier, that it's it it does matter what's in your you know the physical part matters too and it's how the the body and the mind interact so it ended up being i think a more complex and more interesting and more intricate story to tell uh but but it, it certainly took longer and was more challenging than i than i thought 
back in you know 2010 when I thought it was just going to be you know introducing the central governor. And I mean, oh, those eight years have been good, right? You've had the the Nike two hour marathon attempt happen over that time. You've had a couple more theories, like you say, of brain training come in. You've you've been able to meet a lot of these interesting people. I mean, the book includes. Malcolm Gladwell, Tim Noakes, um, I know Trent Steingraff as well. Um, you know, some really cool names and really cool events you've been able to be part of as, as this through this eight year process. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, this is an interesting thing about writing about living science. That it, this is, I mean, the downside is, of course, I don't have a conclusion because uh, we're, we're still scientists are still trying to figure out exactly how it works. And uh, but the upside is, it, it's, it's alive. There's there's new stuff happening. There's there's new new experiments coming out and new and there's you know as you said there's stuff like the breaking two project that that kind of brings some of these debates into the flesh and into the life so it's been really fun to write about and in a sense one of the challenging things to do was was to actually stop writing to say okay you know what i know progress is going to keep happening uh but I have to write the book at some point. It can't be. It, this isn't my diary that I can keep for the rest of my life. At some point, I have to say, this is where it was, circa 2018. But you know, like I finished the book. I, I, I literally the the day or the the week that I sent in the final revisions and edits. I went to a conference in Winnipeg and saw just some amazing talks on the physiology of free diving, which I discuss in the book. And I was like, oh man, I wish I could have added that to the book. And then a couple of weeks after that, there was a great new study on the physiological effects of smiling on running economy, which I discuss in the book. It's like, oh, I wish I could have added that to the book. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of getting getting used to the fact that when you write about science that's active and ongoing, there's always going to be, uh, you know, new new stuff coming down the pike. Fortunately, so far, I don't think anything is like, there's nothing where I'm like, oh, I got it all wrong. But there's always new new uh, new wrinkles coming out that I wish I could have included. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like, Molly wrote a nutrition book, so she can certainly identify with that. Um, but yeah, you haven't had to put a retraction in the newspaper yet or anything like that. Not yet, not yet. I mean, look, uh, one thing I can guarantee is there will be within a year, I'm sure, or maybe maybe within a week, I don't know, there will be things that, I, that I've that i gotten wrong. I mean, that's the nature of writing about science. It's not settled yet. And I'm, I'm trying to prepare myself for that moment so that I don't shed too many tears because, it's, you know, I've done my best to... to to get it right, and also to at least explain why I'm saying what I'm saying, so that uh, people can understand the justification. But let's uh, let's all prepare for that moment. There, I'm sure there will be something that eventually gets contradicted. I think being a reporter, you kind of have to have some kind of like meditative practice to tolerate a certain amount of <laughs> criticism on different stuff, especially when you're in sort of this science of fitness field. Yeah, there's there's no shortage of people who are not shy about letting you know if they think you've got something wrong. And yeah, you know, I would say ninety five percent of the time that they're wrong, but sometimes they're right. And that you know, it's tough for the ego, but yet you, you kind of have to try and listen to the criticism. And and when it's when it's fair to say, ah, you're right, I, I I didn't do that as well as I could. You know, none of us mm-hmm. are perfect, so we're, we're, we're we just yeah, you know, we do our best, but it is tough. You're right. I also have to ask. How did you get Malcolm Gladwell to write the foreword? Like, what a cool, amazing thing to have. That was definitely uh, 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 an amazing victory and cause for celebration. So the, the backstory goes back to uh, 1978 when Malcolm Gladwell was the uh, Ontario High School 1500-meter uh, champion for his, his age group. Um, so he's he's an excellent runner. He's a very talented runner. He was one of the best in the country of his age as a sort of 14 and 15 year old. Um, and he's actually a, a very good runner now. He's pretty close to five minute miling in his uh, in his 50s. Oh. Um, so and he's he's a track fan. He's he's uh, he's a legit. Uh, you know he he's a very very serious uh, fan of the sport. So he pays attention to this stuff. So, uh, the, I mean, it's a long and circuitous story, but uh, um, he was in town. He actually he ran briefly for the University of Toronto track track team, and I was I was uh, I live in Toronto, and so he was giving a talk to the University of Toronto track team, just you know, as, uh, to be nice when he was passing through town. He gave a little little talk, and some friends of mine who were who trained with that team invited me to come by. When I was at the talk, I invited him to come to our Temple Run the next day because we have a sort of Old guy, old guy's temple run in Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto, and he he, he came and did a run with us, and so that established a, a connection, and so we've we've exchanged emails now and then, and so it was with great trepidation that I eventually sent him an email, 
was asking if he'd consider either blurbing the book or maybe even writing a, a short forward. And, and he was extraordinarily gracious about it and, and agreed to do it. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I thank my lucky stars because he's a, you know, he's, he's a, a big track guy and he's just the, obviously the kind of voice that, that, uh, have, has made a lot of people take a second look at the book. So I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, but, but yeah, it all comes from the fact that he was, he was the Afsa midget 1500 meter champion in 1978, I think. And I, as a, as a matter of fact, was the Afsa midget 1500 meter champion in 1991. So we're, we're part of the, the great generation of, of grade nine Ontario runners. Um, the, the elite for, club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, the rare and equal elite club of, of guys who were fast in grade nine and wish they were faster in grade 13, but, but weren't necessarily. So, um, yeah, we have that in common. Hey, Pete, I was going to say, what, what do you have? I was going to say, Peter's been dying to ask, and I don't know if he will. He wants to know what pace your tempo run was with Malcolm Gladwell. Because <laughs> you, you dropped him. I just need to know how fast I need to run to, to drop Malcolm Gladwell. Why would you want to drop him? I probably wouldn't. So that, yeah, that was actually a, a big dilemma, right? Cause I've, I've, you know, Obviously, having Malcolm Gladwell your tempo run is amazing. Um, and so then the question is, should I just run with him so I can keep him company? Or would that be annoying if I've been talking to him? Or, uh, you know, and then I thought, you know what, if, if it were me, I would want everyone to just do the run they were going to do and, and not, you know, uh, treat me with, with kid gloves. So that's what, that's what we all did. I, I, at our tempo run, usually the, the, it, it, there's a great variety. It depends on who shows up on the day, but it's typical to run to go through 5K in about 18 minutes, and uh, I think that's probably about what I did. And I think Malcolm was probably, I can't remember if he was maybe about 19 minutes um, for 5K. So you know, for a tempo run, again, he's legit. He's a he's a that's very he's good. a very good runner. Yeah, I was gonna say I could like hope to keep up with him, and that would be like the best thing I could handle. Well, and that cemetery isn't flat either, so. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think next then, I guess the only, that sort of cued me in the, I don't know if Molly's got to the point about Tim Johnson, but Tim Johnson's in the book. Did you know that? I saw it in your notes and I'm yeah, very excited so about it. Yeah, so Tim Johnson raced cyclocross and he, one of my favorite quotes is actually, maybe you can even tell the story better. And I think it again, sort of, I, I guess gives you pause after you've read all the book, but they, him and Jesse Thomas, who's triathlete also for Red Bull, go through and, and they, they were doing all these crazy things and they have all these sensors tied up on them and then they eventually just get into sort of a, a competition in red bull not in cyclocross no Tim they're going on a track but maybe alex can tell the story about <laughs> sort of just like what their conclusion is at the end of all these like crazy tests and getting poked with lactate things and everything yeah so you know this was a, a, a this weird sort of training camp slash science experiment that red bull put on uh, a couple years ago they were they wanted to play around with the idea of electric brain stimulation, which has been shown uh, the evidence kind of back and forth. But there's there, it seems there's some reasonable evidence that you can trickle a weak electric current through your brain and and uh, change your body's perception of effort and and or how hard your your brain perceives your body is working, so you can push a little harder. And so they were trying this. They brought in uh, four or five of their elite Red Bulls, elite cyclists and triathletes, and they were doing a bunch of you know, lab tests and then four kilometer cycling time trials after having their brain stimulated. And they were doing it with real stimulation and with sham stimulation. So they were but without telling the athletes so that they do this, these sorts of series of time trials, not knowing whether they'd had the real uh, stimulation. And so with each round, since Jesse and, uh, and Tim were relatively evenly matched, they were kind of, you know, as, how could you not do this? They're kind of comparing times. Like, Ooh, how fast did he go? Oh, did I go a little bit faster? And so it became this this thing with each round to see who would who would get faster. And I think T Tim, on the penultimate uh, time trial, Tim Tim had the fastest time, and on the final one, Jesse had the finest time, fastest time. And and you know, so there was lots of sort of good natured rivalry and ribbing. But but I couldn't help but wonder. Okay, well did we just see brain stimulation in action? Was it, did, did Tim win when he got the real brain stimulation and did Jesse win when he got the real brain stimulation? So I, I was able to get a peek at the randomization protocol. So I, from one of the researchers to see who got it. And it was the opposite. It was actually Tim had won when he didn't get brain stimulation and Jesse had won when he didn't get brain stimulation. <laughs> so, so it was, this was kind of a, another one of those moments. And there are a few of them in the book 
where I think certainly for me, it kind of put on the brakes a little bit to say, wait, well, don't get carried away with how, how important this is that, that there's, there's a lot of factors that go into performance and it's not just you stimulate your brain or you, you know, learn motivational self-talk and all of a sudden you're going to win every race. But it was, but it was also interesting to hear Tim and Jesse talking about this and, you know, when they were having this competition, at one point, Jesse said something along the lines of, you know, it's funny, I've got, you know, 17 wires sticking out of my body, and there's how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment, of, of, you know, equipment surrounding me. But at the end of the day, this is what it all comes down to, two, two men on bikes trying to beat the crap out of each other. And, uh, you know, that, and really, that's, I, I think it's important not to get away from that, to remember that, uh, you know, that this is what's interesting about it. And, and fundamentally, if we get too far away from just, you know, competition, whether it's with yourself or with, with someone else, uh, into just like, you know, how can I wire myself up to go 1% faster? Then I think we, we, we lose something. Right. And similar to you and Malcolm, just in the, the park, right? Like that's really just the, that's why we do it, right? You go out and you run hard, you get your workout and, you know, there's a little bit of fun competition or serious competition or, or whatever, right? But to get too far away from that gets... It gets questionable, I think. The the one area I wanted to ask, and I'm glad you went, I wasn't necessarily going to go to brain training, but you, you went there. So the, the other part that sort of got looped in with that was some of the Tylenol-based stuff. And, and you don't talk a lot about it in the book, but I was wondering if you could, could even just for my own interest, sort of where you stand with Tylenol and, and some of the NSAID stuff around exercise. Yeah, this is tricky, and it ties into a, a, a much bigger sort of question. So... So the deal is Tylenol enhances performance. Uh, at least there's reasonable evidence that it does. It, it, you know, it can increase time to trial performance. Uh, it, it it blocks your pain sensations, and it seems in some studies it's been like a two percent improvement, which is substantial. Um, so should you take Tylenol? Well, my my take is is no. <laughs> like that that's t- taking Tylenol is bad for you when you don't need it. And it's not within the spirit of the sport. But you could also say, well, what's the difference between taking Tylenol and taking a cup of coffee or, uh, you know, drinking beet juice? And I, I guess the, I, I differentiate a little bit between what I feel about sport and what I feel I can impose on other people. So what I feel, look, I, so I, for the last 10 years or so or more, I've been writing about the science of endurance and, and ways you can improve and, and, and things like that. So I've written, I, I mean, it's almost a joke now how many articles I've written about beet juice and I've written a lot about caffeine saying it's the most reliable, uh, you know, performance enhancer. Personally, I have never tasted beet juice. I have no interest in, in it because I'm not sort of competing for a living right now. And I never really was, uh, caffeine. I don't drink coffee. I rarely drink tea. I've never taken a caffeine pill. I've never taken any form of caffeine before a race. And I still race every, you know, uh, uh, you know, regularly. Um, so to me, these are not what is interesting about endurance, that I, I'm not interested in being a fraction of a percent faster because I took a pill. It just doesn't hold. And, and, and so Tylenol is even a step beyond that because it's a pill that potentially has some negative effects if you're using it when you, when you shouldn't. It's a, especially as a painkiller that could be blocking other other important for sources of f- feedback. So I don't think it's a good idea. Now, w- on what level would I start condemning other people for doing things? That's trickier because, you know, everyone has their own context for what sport means to them. And especially if you get to professional athletes who are making a living, you know, wh- who am I to, to, you know, judge a struggling Kenyan runner who's trying to lift himself out of po- poverty if he chooses to drink beet juice. Like I, I would, that, that's not appropriate for, for me to decide that my sort of amateurish ideal of sport is, is the one he should follow too. So when it comes to pro athletes, I guess I would say we have to pick a line. We have to, we have to understand that there's a gray area, that there's no natural philosophical reason that caffeine should be allowed and, uh, you know, pseudoephedrine shouldn't. We, but still, we have to we have to draw the line somewhere. So we'll make a rule or make a make a list, accept that it's arbitrary, and then everyone has to adhere to that rule. So Tylenol is not banned. So if I heard that a pro athlete was taking Tylenol, uh, you know, I would I would understand the rationale. But boy, I, I I hope it doesn't become widespread, and I don't think it's a good idea for for a number of reasons. Yeah, and I think there's definitely like some side effects too of of any of these NSAIDs, right? Like I can't remember with Tylenol whether it's kidney or liver. I think it's kidney. 
Um, but there's definitely some like possible side effects too, like unrelated to performance, right? Like if you sort of broaden that out to, to health. Yeah, so uh, the, the the more serious ones are the are the NSAIDs, which are things like Advil, uh, and they they can have uh, more more immediate and direct effects on your stomach, for example. So th- there's there's like there's really clear flashing danger signs that you should not be taking NSAIDs like Advil, ibuprofen, uh, when it's not required. Tylenol it tends to be a little bit more. Uh, it, it you have to work a little harder to to, to get yourself in trouble with Tylenol, uh, but it's it's still uh, it can have negative effects uh, and it can block pain signals that you need to hear. So uh, t- yeah, ty- Tylenol is bad, but 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 NSAIDs are worse. And I, and I think so. The interesting thing out of the Tylenol, which you also point out, is you know it gives us a chance if we look past the like performance enhancement and we look at this as you know perhaps a research or, or sort of just experiment thing that the. Tylenol sort of gives us a chance to see what happens when we change sort of that perception, that perceived exertion a little bit, right? Because it, it does blunt some of that pain signal. Um, can you speak a bit to that and sort of, you know, how, what path that takes us down then? Yeah, so, I mean, that's why, I, I, like, I write about these studies because I think they're really interesting for what they tell us about the way the body works, not because I think we should all go and start mainlining Tylenol. So, the, the, the Tylenol thing is interesting because it, it's it's actually a really open and controversial question about to what extent does pain limit you when you're uh, w- when you're uh, you know doing endurance exercise and there's been some studies that show that pain is less of a, a limiter than effort and we usually kind of think of pain and effort all wrapped together as the the idea that if you're out there hammering a race it feels hard it's painful and it's effortful but you can actually differentiate those two things pain is is uh you know uh, well we know what pain is it's like physical uh discomfort effort is just it feels hard to continue it's the struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop and so if you if you ask someone to get on an exercise bike and cycle to exhaustion and every minute you say okay tell me how much physical pain you're experiencing in your legs and tell me how hard it is for you to continue to maintain this pace uh both pain and effort will gradually increase but at the at the just before the person has to give up what you'll find is that their pain is is nowhere near 10 out of 10 it's more like 6 out of 10 6 7 out of 10 and whereas their effort is at 10 out of 10 so it's effort that that determines when you have to give up not pain but pain is still even so even though pain doesn't max out during endurance exercise for the most part um it still contributes to the sense of how hard it is and so that's how it seems to be how Tylenol works, that it reduces the pain. So maybe you're feeling 5 out of 10 instead of 6 out of 10. And so in that global sense of how miserable you are and how, how much you feel you need to stop, reducing your pain, blocking the pain a little bit, uh, just gives you the ability to keep pushing a little harder for a little bit longer. Okay, great. And then you sort of propose again one of the main themes is that you know perhaps it's not all power for cycling or i guess power for running now too but all pace for running um you know some of these garmin derived or or, you know computer derived data points you know some of us you know all of us should be looking a bit more at that perceived exertion that rpe metric um how we feel um as well as maybe the the result that we get as well out of that, but less so concerned. I guess I get this is sort of me interpreting it, but that middle ground, the adaptations or the the certain adapt, you know, physiological adaptations or thresholds or whatever, is that sort of accurate? We're sort of looking at the feeling in the moment and then comparing that to the results we're getting. Yeah, and and this goes back to what we were talking about at the start with the cherry blossom race. If you are trying to run an even pace then you're, you've predetermined that you haven't made any allowance for whether you're having a wonderful day or a terrible day or, uh, you know, anything, anything else that might affect your pace. If you've learned to tune into your effort uh, rather than pace or, or even or power, for example, on cycling, then that can kind of give you a little more leeway to be able to, if you're having a great day, then that's going to correspond to your effort to, to a given pace feeling a little easier and you're going to be able, you're going to be able to make those adjustments and understand when you can afford to be a little more aggressive and push a little harder and conversely understand when it's not your day and you, you're just going to need to back off because despite the fact that you sh- think you should be able to maintain a given pace, 
it's not going to happen today. And so if, if you've learned to tune into your effort, then in theory, like th- there's an analogy that's often used in, in, in uh, uh, psychology and in, in, in um, environmental psychology that if you're riding a motorcycle and you want to figure out how fast you're going, you can look at the speedometer or you can just, be aware of the optic flow of the scenery flying by beside you. And if you're a, a novice motorcycler, you better be looking at the speedometer because you don't have a good sense of, of what your safe ability to, to, to ride is. But if you're an expert motorcycler, rather than looking at the speedometer to, to have some machine estimate how, how, hard you're, how fast you're going, you should be able to feel from the, from the optical flow whether it's safe. And, and it's even more for, for running or cycling or something like that any any external measurement, whether it's uh, you know of your of your VO2 or your power or your pace or your heart rate, all of that's trying to do all that's trying to do is estimate how hard you're you're pushing, and you can just pay attention. You 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 can detect, you can feel how hard you're pushing. Now, there's definitely a role for knowing your power, your pace, whatever your heart rate, these things, because uh, because because your mind can play tricks on you, but if you come to rely on those things completely and, and lose the ability to tune into how you're actually feeling, then I think that uh, m- m- makes it maybe a little bit harder to, to, uh, to be right on that razor's edge then. Yeah, I think you're completely right. And I like that you gave that analogy with the motorcycle because one of my questions was just, how does one start figuring out their RPE? Because I know you know, people who are newer to the sport who, you know, haven't been training since they were much younger. And like, I don't know, I came to sport pretty late in life. So for me, figuring out what feels hard, what feels easy, what's kind of in the middle is very difficult. So do you have any tips for kind of how to figure out that scale for yourself? Yeah, I mean, and I think that's, again, that's, it's like with the novice motorcyclists watching this, you know, watching this speedometer makes sense. And and similarly, that's where you know there's lots of there's lots of training guidance about training zones where your heart rate should be, where your power should be, whatever metric you want to use. Uh, the, there, there's lots of um, kind of uh, guidance to use that, and then you can start to match up with how it felt, and you can start to move away from that. And and I think <coughs> ultimately, I think it's just good to be observing and paying attention to how you feel during some of these runs. And, and, you know, in terms of what the right, what the right effort level is for easy, easy efforts or easy rides versus hard ones. Of course, th- there's different schools of thought on that. And, and, but, but there's some general advice and also just training with other people is also a pretty useful thing to, to, uh, to get a sense of how other people do it, especially more experienced athletes. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you have to do the same thing that they do, but I, I, I definitely get the sense that it's always eye-opening for relatively novice athletes to run with an experienced athlete on an easy day and be like, oh, this 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 person goes slower than I go, and yet they're f- way faster than I am in races. That, that people don't realize how easy easy days are for, for a lot of people. But anyway, I, I think, yeah, having some external guidance, when you're especially when you're new to the sport, is useful to set your 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 effort gauge, but you have to kind of consciously be paying attention to how, how okay how easy does this feel? How hard am I breathing? Am I able to carry on a conversation? Okay, now in some other context, when I'm not when I'm running without my heart rate monitor, I'm going to be able to replicate this based on the feeling. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think as as coaches, we've sometimes overcomplicated this, especially for newer newer athletes. You know, it's it's sometimes you know just having people going out and doing something, well, now we have an anchor, right? You know, if it's your goal is to run, walk a 5K, you just need to get through it. Like you've now given that that's how far you have to go. Run, walk it. You can walk 5K and then next time we'll do better or faster or, you know, more run, walk intervals or longer run, walk intervals, right? And um, there's a lot of ways to sort of ease people into that, I think. And I think that's sometimes where training programs and coaches myself included, sometimes overcomplicated with 15 zones. And I was going to say, I get thrown <laughs> by the one to 10. Like I just really need like one, two, three or something. For perceived for, exertion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can st- touch on that, Alex. Um, you know, the, either the Borg scale or whatever one you think makes the most sense uh, as far as, you know, when we're measuring this, this perceived exertion, how do we, how do we do that practically? Or are we supposed to do that? 
Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I, I definitely don't put a Borg scale rating in my training log or anything like that. Uh, and I don't, I don't sort of think of it that way either. Uh, to me for now, you can get as complicated as you want. And at a certain point, for advanced athletes, then sure, it's great to start to really quantify things and, and, and try and understand was this, a, you know, was this tempo run an 8 out of 10 when it should have been a 7 out of 10 or something. But for the most part, from my perspective, training prescription, there's three zones, and you can identify those three zones with the talk test with no, you know, pretty well with the talk test. If you can speak in complete sentences, you're, do, you're in the right place for the most of your training uh, and, you know, your easy, your easy training. Uh, if you can speak in short phrases, you're in the kind of tempo zone. You should do a little bit, you know, whether it's we can argue about the precise percentages, and I don't think it really matters, but maybe you're going to do 80% below it, below the talk threshold, um, and then maybe 10% and 10% in the two other zones, or 15 and 5 or something, where you can talk in short phrases and you can only talk in single bursts of words. So those, to me, those are the three zones, and and they, you know. They're not perfect, but they work pretty well. Where if if you can't talk, if you, if you wouldn't be able to talk to a training partner, you're you're not going easy. And uh, if 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 you can talk in more than a word at a time, you're not going really hard. And then there's medium where you can hear somewhere in between. Yeah, I think that's that's good. We we've had Steven Seiler on the podcast, um, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah. And and he's similar. I mean, all the studies for polarized training are basically based on a three zone system, basically as you described. And he was giving. I was just watching a talk that he gave. Actually, I was gonna say I feel like I just heard this. And he was talking about just coaching kids, even and thinking like green, yellow, red, and like red is the red zone. Like it's really hard, and you know, green is just like happy, and you know, it's it's easy, and like you say, social. The nice thing about the talk test is it's it's emphasizing the social aspect of those you know those long runs. Right? Yeah, you get weird looks if you're just doing that on the trail by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like the, uh, the, the the smiling stuff I, I talk about in the book it's like yeah maybe, maybe smiling uh, can 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 enhance your performance or make things feel easier but you also get some funny looks if you're out there grinning by yourself yeah you look like the joker or something yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> it's more like a grimace when I do it so yeah we'll, we'll skip that <laughs> okay so I don't know if we're going to end on this it's probably the most contentious thing but I thought you know you, you touch on fueling which is always the the big sort of, as you say, people, people comment and everything else. But I thought you did a fantastic job, as most of your, your articles do as well, as keeping any sort of your own biases out and just sort of prevent presenting a couple practical examples, some of the research. Um, so I wonder if you could just touch a bit on sort of fueling endurance and, you know, what that, that means, you know. And I think for the, you know, the consummate athlete, the person who's not a, a pro, but, you know, is concerned about, you know, going out and running with, hard on a Saturday with their, their group run or something like that. Like where are we at with endurance? Yeah, boy, you're dropping me in the deep end on this one. Eh? This is, yeah. Uh... And like if you could keep it to, you know, 30 yeah. seconds. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter <laughs> link, <please. laughs> yeah. So and this can look, be your opinion too. I mean, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So here, here, here are some, so look, the, as, as you know, the big debate right now is, you know, is a, a lot, a uh, high fat or low carb diet superior to a traditional high carb, low fat diet. I think there's a, a couple things I can say with confidence. One is that our perspective has definitely changed over the last 10 years, pretty dramatically. I think that most people would have been really, most scientists and experienced athletes would have been pretty adamant that you can't run a good marathon if you've been eating no carbs, like it's not, or very low carbs. Like it's just not going to work. You, you're, you're not even going to be able to get to the finish. That, that position has changed now. The, uh, it, it does appear clear that if you, for people who go on a, say, a ketogenic diet, they can actually adapt pretty well and they can go out and run marathons and maybe they have to make some, you know, do some strategic carb use before long runs and things like that. Uh, or maybe not depending on who you listen to, but it is more possible than people thought to, to be an endurance athlete on a, a low carb uh, diet. Now where, where I, where I think the claims get uh, overstretched, is the idea that this is a better way of being an endurance athlete. It's a now, very like slight differentiation, but a very important one. <laughs> yeah. Now, now if, if, if someone is arguing that, 
low carb, high fat is healthier for reasons, you know, one through 47. Um, look, I, I'm not the expert on that. I don't know the answers. Uh, my personal bias is I eat a pretty, like a Mediterranean style diet. I, so, um, and that's where I think things are at, but I also think that's tasty. So I'm, I'm biased to not want it, to, not want to have to change my diet. So I don't know the answer and I'm not going to try and pretend to be the expert on that. But when it comes to athletic performance, if you're going to claim that low carb, uh, a low carb, high fat diet approach isn't just compatible with endurance, but is superior for endurance performance, then I'm going to say, well, I would like to see one single shred of evidence for that. And I would also, you know, in the book, I do, I make a, a few points like the fact that if you look at the all time list for say the marathon, you will see it's, you know, the top 100 are 95% from Kenya or Ethiopia. There have been studies of their diets. They eat like 60 to 70% carbohydrate. So um, I, think, I think it's pushed too far to say that it's superior. Now, when you talk about ultra-endurance performance, 24 hours, say, or, or you know, very long performance, or even Ironmans, then you have some interesting points like uh, carbohydrates may be superior, but they may also promote gastrointestinal distress after, you know, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. And maybe if you switch to a low carb ap- approach, you're able to rely less on exogenous, you know, on external fuel. And maybe that works better for some people. I'm, I'm open to that possibility. But for now, I, I guess what I would take away from, from this is for people who are, as you say, you know, they just want to be properly fueled for the, run, the group run on Saturday. There are multiple ways you can do it. There is no need to adopt, uh, like there's no evidence that you will be better off if you adopt uh, a low carb, high fat approach. If you if you like low carb, high fat approaches, it it does seem pretty clear that you will you should be able to handle endurance uh, with that approach too. Uh, you may have to make some adjustments to taking some carbs carbs before the long run. It depends. There's there's various approaches to that. But I guess I guess what I would the takeaway I guess if I can sum it up is there's no evidence that you need to do anything that you weren't going to do anyway, uh, other than follow best practices for whatever approach you're, you're using. So if you're eating a standard, you know, relatively, you know, balanced diet Mediterranean style, then if you're going for a long run, make sure you've had enough carbs the night before, because uh, you, you, and and probably ideally if, if you take, take a few before you head out on your long run or ride, uh, because you will have burned some carbs overnight, and and uh, and if it's long enough, you should take some during the the run or the ride too. Um, but uh, I don't know. How's that for for? Uh, <laughs> it's it's for, good. I'll for see covering if, a very complex topic. I mean, I'll, I'll see if I can give some more sort of targeted questions. I guess sort of try and guess what people are are wondering. Um, so, would you say there's possible benefit to doing you know uh, you know going running in the morning and just not eating beforehand? Yeah, that's that's a, that's yet another topic. The the idea of fasted training, which is essentially the equivalent of wearing a you know a, the nutritional equivalent of wearing a weighted vest. It makes your running a little harder, and it might it pro- it probably enhances your your fat burning capabilities a little bit. Um, I, I I think it's it's clear that it it triggers more adaptations uh, from the training session. Uh, there may be a cost to it in, in that you may then not, you may run slower because you're not properly fueled. Um, so uh, I think it's an, a, an approach that's worth experimenting with if you like experimenting with those sorts of things, but is not, it, it's the kind of chasing half a percent marginal gains and, and where there's also a risk of do, getting doing worse rather than better. So it's it's something you have to treat with with caution. Yeah, I think the that's been my experience both personally and then with clients is you know there's there's maybe some benefit there there's some maybe some practicality out of running certainly you know if it's not a crazy long session you know just not having stuff in your gut or having to spend that time in the morning but the amount of people who end up you know in the subsequent days and weeks getting sick or tired or you know sad or I think that's because that's people that go out and do like an hour tempo workout or something instead of like a 20 minute easy run. Well, and I guess that that's it, right? It's it's a very slippery slope, I think, is the, the thing versus just, you know, even if we pull this diet thing back out, you know, rather than low carb, high fat, like why not, 
you know, just not vilifying fat and eating vegetables and leaving some time between your meals. Um, like, do you still think that that's really the, the, the step one for most of us, Alex, or, or what, where, where do you see that is for the, the every, every normal person? Yeah. So when I started writing about some of the studies on the low carb, high fat, I remember I had some debates with, uh, my editors who were putting headlines on about, you know, the age of skim milk is over. Endurance athletes can eat fat after <laughs> all. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, I haven't. I, I don't think I've ever drunk skim milk in my life and I've been in, you know, a, a pretty obsessive endurance athlete. And it's like, you know, I, I'm all about eating, you know, salmon and avocado and getting, getting, you know, plenty of fat in my, in my diet. And it's, you know, another great example is I remember there was an article in, in men's journal that was like the new age of endurance athletes eating fat. And it was all about these athletes who were eating low carb, high fat diets and changing the world. And one of the examples was Simon Whitfield, the Olympic a triathlon champion and so i was like oh, i wonder what this diet is so i went to his website and he had just answered a question so i was like someone had asked what do you, what do you mean by this like this low carb high fat diet and he's like yeah i only eat about 50 percent carbs maybe 20 <laughs> percent protein or 20 percent fat 30 percent fat it's like yeah okay that's pretty much pretty close to what sports nutritionists would say anyway so i think there's kind of a straw man that the high carb people are like yeah, if you want to be a great endurance athlete, you have to eat nothing but white sugar and Wonder Bread. And it's like, no, that's actually not what anyone is recommending. So, um, yeah, to me, it's all, you know, and, and, you know, as we talk here, I guess it was yesterday, there was a the new study from Stanford that dropped on uh, comparing just for weight loss, low carb and high and, and low fat diets. And the, the, the takeaway from that was what they said is they both work equally well, but the, the key was the emphasis. Both groups were told work on having lots of vegetables, lots of whole foods, whole grains, cook at home, don't eat in front of a screen. It's like, to me, that's where the most, whichever diet, dietary, like when I talk to people who are eating paleo, it's like often their diets sound amazing. I'm like, that's all great. You know, you choose not to have rice or pasta. That's you know that's fine with me, but the things you're eating, the nuts and the vegetables and the the meat, oh, that sounds all fine to me. Like it's not. Uh, the, the, to me, what's more important is what's in your diet than what's missing from your diet. So my my approach for most of my life has been, I try to work hard to make sure I'm getting enough vegetables, enough fruit, some you know healthy stuff like fish, and whatever I have room to eat after that, I, I go for it. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I don't just load up on Twinkies, but if I want to have some, some sweets, I have it. If I want to have some fatty things, I have, I, I don't worry it too much as long as I'm getting the things I, I, that I think there's good evidence that I need like fruits and vegetables and fish and stuff like that. Yeah. I actually saw that study too. And I, I think I pitched it to bicycling. It's just like, can I just be moderate on both? <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was my headline. <laughs> Um, yeah, totally. Okay, so I think to wrap up, Peter, do you have any other questions? Or yep. Okay, so my last question is sort of a good chance for you to plug this book, but why should an amateur racer pick this up and read it? Well, let me give you my seven-point sales plan. Yeah, if you have a uh, no. PowerPoint, we'll include that in the <laughs> <Yeah>. show notes. <laughs> So the main thing is that I guarantee you will improve your race times by 14.8% mm. uh, or your money back. Uh, no, okay. Look, I, honestly, I would say the number one reason from my perspective is that I think there's a bunch of amazing stories in there. I, I think it's just fun. Like there's, if you're interested in endurance, if you're, if you're someone who's, who's been out there and tried pushing your limits in whatever respect, whether it's, uh, on the basketball court or in a, in a race or, or, or just, you know, at the gym or whatever. I think it's fun to think about this stuff. And I, I've really, you know, I spent nine years gathering what I think are, are some of the coolest stories and, and some of the most surprising facts and studies about it. So hopefully it's an enjoyable way to spend a few hours. It definitely Second is. Of all. <laughs> I was just going to say, sorry. <laughs> Uh, reading some of the stories, I now have a giant list of like dumb shit that I want to try at some point. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's a little dangerous. It can inspire you to do, to, to do crazy things. But also I, I think in terms of like more seriously, in terms of like practical or not practical, but takeaways, the main thing I would hope someone would take away from it is, is that, is this idea that 
the limits that feel totally like unchangeable and physical are actually almost always mediated by the brain and negotiable. There is some reserve there. And it's easy to say that, right? Like I, you know, I was on the subway the other day and I saw someone with a Lululemon bag that's saying, you know, oh, you have, if you set goals, you're activating your subconscious computer. And I'm kind of like, Hmm, that's kind of what my book was saying. And I hope my book is not just a, a giant sort of Lululemon slogo, uh, <laughs> slogan, but, but, but the thing is, so, so it's, it's making these points about the nature of, of, of limits but hopefully, like I'm a very skeptical guy, and so it, it's marshalling the arguments and the science to to say to hopefully convince people to 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 go to the point where you can you can say yeah that makes sense and it can alter hopefully your 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 perception of what it means when you reach that point where you feel you can't go further so you, so you can change your perspective and and say well maybe I can go a little bit further and so then then there are some specific things I talk about in the book like motivational self talk where you can actually take action and try and uh, try and alter that. But, but the bigger thing I think is just this general change in view of limits of, of, of from the idea that when you go for a run and you, you reach your, you know, you feel like you have to slow down, you, you, you view that not as a unalterable physical reality, but as something that you can kind of fight against and negotiate with. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great book. I think I'm definitely it's going to be recommended to a bunch of my clients just strictly just on the introduction to all these elements of of training of endurance. Right, we have fuel, hydration, uh, certainly the mental aspects. Um, you know, it, it's just there's a lot of good some heat for your Leadville guys. Heat training is there. I think altitudes even there. So there's all these elements wrapped in, as you say, in some great stories. You know, there'll be some familiar names for people depending on which which sports they come on, and some some new ones. You know, so the mountaineering and um, free diving and all this stuff as well. And certainly the scientists are good to know the names as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And if you see a, a guy kind of chasing you guys down in the cemetery wearing like a Shrek jersey. Yeah, it sounds really spooky. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the zombie. Yes, yeah, that's, it, there's it, a it, zombie. That's not me. I'm beside him. It's either a zombie or Peter, one or the other. <laughs> either way, pick up your pace. <laughs> You'll drop them. No worries. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for for having me on, guys. And uh, the the Temple Run is is most weeks nine fifteen a.m. at the Beltline entrance of Mount Pleasant Cemetery. Hey guys, before you go, we just wanted to have one quick word from our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ is a life insurance company that helps the consummate athlete like you save money on your life insurance. To find out more, you can check out healthiq.com slash capod. That's C A P O D for all the details and to take a free quiz. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. To check out all of the show notes for this show, go to consummateathlete.com. And to follow along with our various adventures on the social medias, you can check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash consummateathlete or follow me, Molly Herford, at Molly J. Herford on Twitter and Instagram. And I am at Peter Glassford on Twitter and Instagram. And if you could do us a huge favor and rate and review the podcast over on iTunes, that helps us bring on more guests, you know, get more episodes out and do more cool stuff. So we would be forever grateful. And if you're looking for coaching for endurance sport or just for health and wellness, uh, you can check out smartathlete.ca. And for amazing outdoor content, you can check out theoutdooredit.com. Aw, honey. And that's theoutdooredit.com for Molly Herford's writing and all things outdoors. All right. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time.